Hey everybody, um, it's me, Russ Qualia. I want to welcome you to our, our second official um, webinar around the work that we're doing around the world. It was interesting as I reflected on today and kicking off today, um, where we were last month. Last month I was in Dubai, as some of you might remember. It was midnight in Dubai. And to show you the kind of extreme life I lead, I'm going to look show you out my window here. I've gone from sand to pure white snow. Uh, the plan today, actually for me to come up to Maine, I live between Maine and Florida, um, was for me to come up to Maine and be with Mickey at Quiza in the Action Lab and, and my team. And I came in yesterday, came to my camp that we're actually building, and, um, and got snowed in. And so I have no way to get out. Fortunately, we have electricity. And, um, and here I am talking from my camp Lord only knows where it's going to be next month. But, um, but I'm glad it all worked out. Mickey is at the office with Sue Harper. And our special guest, Steve Kenning, is on from London. So we'll bring him up in just a bit. Let me give you a few updates from, from the last time. Also, it's fun for me to see um, some people here that we've had. On time. I'm looking at people like, uh, like Aaron and, and Eric. And just it's awesome to see the same people come back. And uh, so thank you. The um, couple updates since the since the Dubai broadcast, LAUSD, that work is still going strong. Um, some of you might have heard that Mrs. King, who was the deputy superintendent, is now the superintendent. At her, when they when they voted for her unanimously at the board meeting, her big statement was that she will be the voice of students. So that that speaks, I think, volumes to the work that we're doing. Frances Gibson, who uh, will be on this. Uh, with us who actually brought us into Los Angeles Unified. She was the superintendent of the East District. Um, she has been promoted and now she is the chief academic officer of all of LAUSD. And although we're solely going to miss her in the, in the East District, having her in the central offices and her support is just second to none. Um, even will help us take this work together with her uh, to another whole level. David Bacchus stays at East Side. So uh, we're working directly with him. So again, that work's come along incredibly well. Today, interestingly enough, heard from both um, the Middle East and Dubai, um, getting that work, starting that work officially in August, and also heard from Sweden today. Um, they obviously must have heard I had a snowstorm. Um, but heading that work up in, in August as well in a place called Orbro, O-R-E-B-R-O -E municipality. Um, I share those things with you because those are the schools that we're going to be connecting with all the schools that are out there. From the school I look at, I'm seeing Eric's face. Um, I see the schools from Oregon, for those in Cobb County who we're doing some work with, which I will ask Lisa Land to talk about in a little bit, um, assuming that she's on. And, um, and, and kind of some updates there. But again, I'm seeing this, this network grow, grow and grow. The, today, matter of fact, we've got representatives representatives from seven different countries, 10 different states. Um, the other exciting news is I got my Delta review back last year and I've flown 437,000 miles last year because that's important to know. Um, the other thing that we're doing at, at Quiz, we had a retreat uh, of sorts last week, interestingly in Florida, not in Maine. Um, and we're taking a deep look at ESSA and how it aligns with with the school voice work around student voice and teacher voice, because there are some real direct connections in there. We can talk a little bit about that later, but we will be producing a report that will be going out in the next, next, by the end of this month, as a matter of fact, um, making those connections. So you can see with the new requirements for ESSA and how they lined up with school voice, um, and that obviously is impacting funding and, and what we can do and what we can't do. Um, I'm very proud to tell you that the principal voice book is now in production. It has gone through the final edit. Um, right now it's in layout. It won't be out, I don't think, until June because that process is not a quick one, but it's out of our hands. The other two books that are coming, uh, Aspire High, um, doing that with Mickey Corso, that many of you know, and Chris, and a colleague of ours in England, Gavin Dykes, um, that allegedly is going to be submitted this Friday. And the second book, uh, or actually the third, I guess, um, is for Teacher Voice, doing that with Lisa Landy, and that will be submitted in the beginning of February. So 
lots of lots of cool things happening. The only other thing I would add, and then we can get into a conversation with Steve that I want to share with you, is I get lots of books all the time that Cohen sends me. Some are good. Well, let me say it this way. Some are better than others. Um, and I want to share with you a book that I, that I read recently that I think, quite frankly, is one of the best books I've, I've written. I've written. I wish I wrote it. Uh, I've read um, in education probably over the past five years. And I was really taken back, taken by it because it was just so well done. It's written by Jim Knight. Some of you know Jim's work um, on instructional coaching and, and so on. Um, and it's called Better Conversations. And it's just it's just a great read. I mean, it's it's it reads like a novel to me. It's got stories in there. It's got some good data in there. It's got reflection points. Um, it's got things for us to think about. There's a whole section in there that challenges our thinking to another level. It just it's a great book. I mean, I love the way it's laid out. I love the way it's written. And I, Jim's one of my favorite educators on the planet. So if you have and you're looking for a good good read, um, Jim Knight's book Better Conversations is is a good one. Um, and no, I do not get a commission on saying that. Um, although I, I think I should. Um, anyway, so that's the scoop there. Let me um, let me bring Steve or Zach. Could you bring Steve Kenning up on stage? And while you're doing that, let me introduce Steve. Steve is the executive director of the Aspirations Academies Trust in England, um, a leader not just in England um, for sure, but but certainly um, an international leader. He is taking the student voice and aspirations work. Um, and taking these concepts, like myself and my team talked about, he's taking it into action, action to the point where he's taking the ideas and, and created schools called Aspirations Academies. Um, I actually chair the board, but it's really under steep leadership that this idea began with one of two schools and now have grown to 12 and pretty soon 13, uh, my guess 14 and 15, uh, even, even more. Um, so Steve, thank you for agreeing to come. Um, but it's so good to have you here. It's interesting when we had someone from Dubai, it was actually midnight there. It's 8 p.m. there, I believe, or a little after 8, so that's a good sign. Um, but again, welcome to the webinar, and what I would love for you to do is share with, with the audience kind of your journey, how you began in this work and where you are right now, and then I'll ask some questions about some challenges. But to again, welcome, and, and please share your journey with us. Okay, thanks Russ, it's good to be here. I'm sorry about the snow, there's just rain and wind in England, so it's not quite the same, but uh, uh, to all the audience, um, just want to say that I knew Russ before he went gray. I, I, I saw <laughs> uh, 20, years ago, 20 years ago, I think your hair was definitely black or, or some dark anyway. But yeah, I heard Russ speak about 20 odd years ago now, I suppose, and um, uh, at the time I was a teacher or principal. So for, for probably 14 years as principal, I used Russ's uh, eight conditions as it was then, the three guiding principles to help uh, develop uh, really outstanding schools. And uh, I, uh, in England, where we're very much measured on attainment and um, results, um, I reckon it added a good 10 or 15% to the results. Developing myself, students, you know, with a sense of purpose. And uh, it has become um, the feature of, it's sort of ingrained in me. And what we learned early on working with the schools that, um, if, if the, the principal um, believed in Russ's work in the aspect of remarkably well in schools, if it was just passed off to some middle leaders as a, another project, it didn't work. And I think we, we realized very quickly that um, the whole, the understanding of the aspirations framework and my voice and student voice had to be embedded in absolutely every aspect of a school. And um, from seeing that, um, it's worked well. Um, my wife, uh, Paula, she's also a head teacher. She used it as well, so we both believe in it. And we started the trust with Russ about five years ago now. And we've had schools for about four years. Um, in England, you can set up schools uh, as academies. You can start your own groups, a bit different to America. Uh, but now we've got 12 schools. And we've got elementary schools. We've got secondary schools or high schools. And we've got sort of post-16 schools. We've also used the opportunity to set up some very different schools. In England, you can develop free schools. Um, so we've got a couple of studio schools, space studio schools, which uh, cope with the, the age 14 to 18 age group. And they tend to be a little bit more vocationally operated. But throughout all these, um, all the schools are doing extremely well. And we've turned schools around, failing schools particularly, and it has been the aspirations framework that has done that. A really good example, um, and you're very welcome to come visit our schools. Um, uh, we've took on Oak Hill, which is a, a, an elementary school, about 
18 months ago and the school was okay, fine, but it lacked confidence as a school. And when Russ talks about student voice, I think one of the important things is teacher voice comes first because if you get the teachers to believe in themselves and give self-worth and, and understand about engagement and the sense of purpose, then that transfers into, into um, student voice. And Oak Hill is absolutely brilliant at the present time. And if you really want to see the place that you walk in, you feel this buzz of excitement. You see fantastic learning, great engagement. And it's purely because the, the leaders, the head teacher and the senior team have got confidence, they've got self-worth, and they've spread that into the staff, given staff the chance to take risks, to, to think about, look at their, their practice and develop, and not to be afraid. And that has been quite remarkable. Because now the student voice there is, is wonderful. You know, the students are involved in any kind of aspect of things. Um, other examples we can use about what we're doing, um, we've got another primary school or elementary school up in Banbury, been we had it for a while now, called Dashwood, and we're in there this week, and uh, they've got a great thing going called Peer Critique. We're trying to develop a lot of project-based learning, and um, this is sort of 10-year-old kids who are actually critiquing each other's work now and giving them really good feedback. And then when the work is improved again and again and again, it's celebrated, so it's shown in assembly, and all the students who've been involved in it celebrate it. So it's really, really a student voice. So you know, it's flying. So yeah, I mean, I think the future is aspirations, really. And um, you know, we're, we're really sort of uh, listening to the developments that Russ and his team make, and we, we do a lot of training with our staff and with our students in terms of uh, my voice, uh, in terms of the aspirations. And we, for the last 15 years now, in our schools, we've been using what was called the My Voice surveys, and we use those quite heavily to get the student and the teacher voice in terms of how we move things forward. And, you know, from a certain point, when we get to our schools to a pretty good level, we then use the, the aspirations framework and things like my voice to incrementally improve it year on year. We're never complacent. Well, how can we make things a little bit better? And it really is a big factor. And I, I've always likened it to a bit like a graphic equalizer, their conditions. And, and we use the my voice and other techniques to, to measure belonging, you know, the, Curiosity, creativity, you know, spirit of adventure, and each year it goes up and down, and then we'll find ways to try and make things improve. So one year belonging could be really high, but because you take your arm a little bit, it could go down, and so on. So you have to do things to work at it. So yeah, it's it's um, for those who are new to the framework, it's a it's a great uh, it's a great system for school improvement. Hope that starts Steve, off. Steve, th yeah, I, well, well, thank you. I I think um, the framework too much credit there. When I when I look at the work that you've done, um, I'll tell you what I've learned from the work. And I want to ask you a couple of questions. What I learned from the work is there's one thing about talking about it, and there's even the difference between a between a school and a school a school adopt that creates this as a way of being. I remember you specifically saying to the schools, "This isn't a program. This isn't an add-on. This is the way we think." So we don't need an aspirations period. We need to under, or, or a specific time to, devoted to aspirations and voice. We are about aspirations and voice, so it should be in your math, your social studies, and so on. And I hear you and Paula talk every single time we would have a board meeting or when I hear you speak in front of your teachers, you're always emphasizing the fact that this is who we are. This is a way of being. This is the air we breathe. Um, and I think that takes the work from a concept into a reality of the school. So you know I, I, I admire you for, for doing that because there's been some challenges. Can you talk to the group, because there's lots of people out there that are doing the similar kinds of things they're trying to, and they get met with challenges. What have been your greatest challenges from your role as the chief executive of this whole operation? What's been your greatest challenge, or what, what have been a few of your greatest challenges of getting this work implemented? I think it, it's all about leadership, and I think the aspirations framework is, is brilliant for that. And you ought to maybe do a, a leader's voice, et cetera, because I think schools do not improve without really good leaders. And I think uh, you have to – framework just gives you something to hang on to. When you start off as a, as a principal, you don't really – you've got your vision roughly, but you've got nothing to hang it on to. And I think we've tried with our senior teams, our senior staff, to try and get them to understand – um, the journey. You know, we've got this diagram with arrows which go in one direction, and you basically want everybody understanding the vision very clearly. And so they're working, working together, supporting because the culture of a, of a school, certainly when it's been dysfunctional, um, is all over the place. And you have people working really hard, but often working totally against each other because they don't understand the vision. 
And what the aspirations framework gives you is this very, very clear vision. And then as a leader, you have to believe it and act on it. So sense of belonging, you know, you talk, you spend time talking to all your staff, the support staff, the administrators and so on. You spend time making them feel good about themselves. If you know, they will then go model it to, to the pupils. You know, I think the aspirations framework is quite good in terms of things like emotional IOUs. If you, if you do something bad or treat people in a wrong way, um, then they go away and treat somebody else bad. And it sort of carries on. So as a leader, I think the framework just gives you this sort of a way of being that you have to model and then people follow it. So the hardest thing I think has been changing the culture of schools and one or two of our schools are still three or four years on only just getting there because you have to move some people on or you have to find different ways to, to train different people to get them to think the way you do and some people never get it uh, some people find it really hard even though everybody says yeah I came into teaching because of the education I believe in all that kind of stuff but not many people practice it. I mean some teachers actually don't like kids which is difficult no. you know, so yeah. See, yeah. That was just a shock that happened. <laughs> see, see. Let me ask. Let me ask you this question because I. It, this is the critique that that both you and I hear is when we're trying to implement something like this. The perception from the outside. And I think this is more perception of the outside. The perception of the outside is you're driving the student voice. You're driving the aspirations. You're actually stricter now than you've ever been. How do you deal with those kinds of issues from the parents or from the outside who really don't understand the work uh, when they say you're being more controlling now than you've ever been? How, how do you respond to that? It's about education. We, we try and do try and run sort of communication and aspiration classes with parents in some areas. We try to do that, but it is very difficult because um, America is better because America has um, higher aspirations, I think, than most people in England. Whenever I go to America, I like the fact that people want to succeed. In England, we're very good at, uh, at pulling people down sometimes when they're successful. And that is, in England, that success isn't always um, sort of uh, the, the sort of way to go. So I'm just going to put message fast to me there. I've got my, my assistant giving me some instructions here. You know, one example is um, we've got Magna Academy, which is a secondary school or high school, which uh, we've turned around in two years with brilliant folks. And people complain that it hasn't got a heart, you know, it's too strict, it's too rigid, and everything else. And yet, the aspirations of the children there have been transformed, the self worth compared to where it was, where we had students who didn't value themselves, now they feel really good, you know, even had a visit from the Prime Minister of England there. And it's brilliant, but to get the parents to understand that, it's taken loads and loads of work to get them into the place to see what's going on. And of course, you can't do that with everybody, but the way to do it is to communicate and show what can be done. I think it's people's lack of understanding, to be honest, which is the problem. They hear things and they, they put two and two together, but when it's aspiration, they value it. So we had a team Magda in, on the south coast in Poole, in England, and we had a, there's complaints and it was in the local paper. So we invited the journalists from the local paper in and they couldn't believe it. They said, this is, they had a great report saying, this is an amazing school. You know, the kids were confident, they valued the place, they loved it. And so it's just turning around that perception, really. But it is a hard one because not everybody wants to get it either. Well, well, Steve, I can tell you this. I think um, actually the aspirations in America might be too high. For example, we have people like Donald Trump who think they can become president. Um, okay, that <laughs> I don't want to go down a politically wrong to, for me to even say, albeit I believe that. Um, my guess is if he does become president, all these people on this website may actually be moving to England or at least Canada, uh, where there will be a wall, I think, between us. Anyway, um, I'm going to get off my political soapbox, and um, I'm going to turn this over to Mick. Please stay on, because I'm sure the people in the audience will have questions for you. I love your honesty, as I always have. Your honesty, your openness, and Lord, your, your leadership is, is exemplary to all of us, quite frankly. So thanks for what you do. I will also let people know, because I know I will forget to do this, um, if you go on to our website, which is, will be we're actually revamping it again. Uh, when you go to our website, there's a big button. There's three major buttons, one for Aquiza, Teacher Voice, and Aspirations Academy Trust. Click on that, and you go right over to the Aspirations Academy Trust and see firsthand what Steve is talking about. So, Steve, thank you. Stay on with us, and we'll get right back to you. Mickey, can we bring Mickey up? And, Mick, can you give us some updates, my good brother, Dr. Corso? Hey, everybody. Happy New Year. Um, 
And thanks, Steve. That was that was great. I always like hearing the updates from what's going on in the schools in England, the uh, Aspirations Academy Trust. I had the privilege of being on the board there. And uh, I, in the last video, I went to those Space Academy schools, and it was pretty cool, um, among other things, to see uh, quotes from Russ Qualley next to quotes from Carl Sagan and uh, Neil Armstrong. <laughs> that was the highlight of my trip. Uh, and, um, and Mother Teresa. Let's not Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa. Yeah, Teresa. I was focusing on the space uh, people, not the saints at this oh, point. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, I'm actually going to go jump right to getting people in groups because I want to take advantage of this shindig platform. Um, and uh, you have two options, actually, once you get in a group with two or three other people. So you know how to do that, right? You just click on a group you want to join, people you see that you might like to talk um, and you have two options. You can just sort of discuss what you heard uh, Steve talk about. Steve talked a lot about how uh, important it was for the principal to be fully on board with this work and to not see it as a program, but rather as a way of being for the entire school. Um, he talked about some of the challenges of perception in the community around the school and how important it was to turn that around, even the practical advice of inviting the, the newspaper in, you know. Let, let them stop getting their stories on the soccer field. Let them come in and get their stories, um, you know, right from the building. So this, maybe you can discuss something he talked about. But then also we had a question submitted from Peter Donaldson is for, for this webinar. The question was, how do you celebrate student voice at your school? So not how do you collect it, how do you use it, but how do you celebrate it? How do you just um, let kids know you're happy to be hearing from them? What, what are your uh, tools for doing that? So two options. Uh, discuss something Steve talked about. Or uh, tell you about how you celebrate school boys in your school. So find uh, a couple or uh, people to talk with in a group. Groups of three usually work pretty well in Shindig, and um, I'll give a, I'll give us about five minutes. So it's uh, three twenty six. Uh, I'll ask everybody to come back starting at around uh, three thirty one. That's Eastern time. So make adjustments uh, accordingly. Okay, great. So if you want to bust out of your groups, um, thank you for doing that. Um, you know, Shindig's are, I think, one of the a huge advance on webinar uh, stuff because you can get into these groups. So let's try this. Um, if you want to raise your hand and we can bring you up just quickly to share something you heard in your group or something you talked about in your group, something that's burning that you want to make sure everybody hears. And if you raise your hand, uh, Zach will bring you up here. Um, and hopefully somebody will have something to say. Um, maybe I will start uh, just while people are simmering about raising their hands by asking Zach to bring up Lisa Landy. Um, Lisa heads up the uh, Teacher Voice Aspirations Institute and um, she commented in the general thing, I don't know if, you're, if you saw that, about uh, giving uh, Steve props for mentioning Teacher Voice. Oh, it says, okay, Lisa doesn't have the bandwidth for her webcam or mic to work. That's a major bummer. Um, anyway, I know uh, Steve's reference to uh, the importance of teacher voice and working through the framework uh, with teachers is critical to the success. We see that in the schools we work with too, um, ensuring teacher self-worth, teacher engagement, and teacher sense of purpose. 
and making sure teachers have a voice. I'm looking forward to that book uh, that Russ and Lisa are writing together on teacher voice and aspirations because that it, that unlocks, we find the work we do in schools with student voice, sometimes you need teacher voice to unlock student voice. Um, so that's critical. Um, anybody raise their hand? Well, I was yapping away there. Not yet. Okay, people are shy. Maybe they don't want to be on an international webinar. Um, you can also uh, ask questions. So maybe Zach bring Russ back up because I do have a couple of questions were submitted uh, in the um, preliminary work, um, you know, the run up to the, the webinar. Hey Russ. So uh, hey, one you know, question that was asked. Right. Oh, I said I was actually going to press that raise your hand button because it just looks kind of a cool thing to do, but. Um, <laughs> you never have to raise your hand. I'm not sure I would raise uh, my hand either. So. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, so we'll get we'll, we'll get in, used to that in future webinars. Um, so here's a question that came up in the preliminary. How do you use student voice in ways that are not connected to evaluation? So one of the trends right now that's happening right um, around student voice is making use of what kids say uh, tied to teacher evaluation. But, but how do you, if you were going to separate the two, because they don't they don't necessarily go together, what what do you see out there? Yeah, I, well, some of the simple logistics of it is at least the way that we're presenting this stuff around the the student voice instrument and the teacher voice instrument is designed that the teacher and the I know my class, which is really the the course assessment piece. It goes directly to the teacher. It doesn't even go into the main administration thing. So if I if I give the I know my class to my own class, I'm getting information in real time. I think the other thing that's, and I'm not just saying about us because other groups do it too, but what we do differently when we're looking at assessment of the classroom per se, um, we're asking kids their perception of the teacher for sure. We're not asking them their perception of does the teacher know the subject matter. We're asking things like does your teacher know your name? Do they know your hopes and dreams? Um, do they understand your different learning style? That's one component. But I think the component that separates this work differently from others is we're asking the students to evaluate themselves. Um, do mm -hmm. I come to class prepared to learn? Um, am I respectful from other people's opinions? And what that does for the teachers, at least the school working with as you know it takes the onus or the burden of assessment off of them but rather to say we're all in this together now administrators can abuse that for sure and there's, there's no way we, that we can get around that because we, we can't control that but i think when we go in there we talk about this as um, complementary to an assessment tool this isn't your assessment tool um, this is a way of thinking about the teaching and learning environment and i think where we get kind of clustered into this thing of teacher evaluations when they see this as an assessment tool um, when in actuality you and i and, and the rest of the team talk about this as an in, as an instrument to understand our students and ourselves and that's not just semantics to me yeah it's the whole environment that we're asking them to weigh in on a part of which is you know teachers performance but uh just a part um yeah, no, that's that's really helpful. And the more people can understand that, uh, I think the better, the more open they are to, to uh, student voice. Um, I'm going to jump out for a second because Steve uh, is going to come back up because um, he, I think, he has something to say about this. So I'm going to just jump out. Um, with Russ, what Russ just um, sorry, to, to, to close my way. Um, I think uh, the, the assessment of the results come as a result of the, the students celebrating their work and their self-worth. I mean, when the students feel good about themselves, they produce much better work. And that's evident in a lot of the work that we see with students. When we've built their self-worth and gotten engaged, given them a sense of purpose, then they feel so good about themselves. They celebrated almost themselves and with their peers. And then their results improve. So that's what it should be used as. It's not it's not a measurement of how good is this work to, in results. It's a measurement of what kind of skills are developing. Well, we're very much in England, I'm sure in the States, uh, about building the skills of the 21st century now, getting real good skills, how they can work with others, working groups, think creatively, think innovatively, all those kind of skills. And that comes from the three guiding principles. If they're feeling good and confident about themselves, if they engage in what they're doing, they can apply themselves. And it just, they celebrate the success. We've got so many examples, I mean, of, of, of students now where they're working on projects and we work with each other. 
and they're celebrating each other's success because you have to work in teams, you have to work in groups. And I think that's uh, that's that's the really important thing to understand as an educator. It's not you don't do this to get better results. You do this because you want to develop the skills and the sort of the self worth, the aspirations of young people, and the results come as a result of it. And you know, Steve, you raise an interesting point because there is no way, and, and we'd be lying to you, there's no way that this work isn't some kind of form of assessment of what we're doing, um, except what we're trying to take this, and you have taken this, to a level of this isn't just a matter of assessing a single piece of the puzzle. This is about assessing the big puzzle. Um, it is an assessment. I mean, we don't go out there and say, here is a teacher evaluation tool, um, or here is a way to create another number for the kids. But it is certainly, it's formative assessment, formative assessment on steroids. Um, it's what can I learn, what the kids are saying, what I am saying, and what does that mean for me? I know one of the questions that, because I, I saw some of the earlier questions was, um, you know, what do you do with this data? And one of the things that we talk a lot about this data, and it does, it turns it from assessment into knowledge, is when you get data back, you create focus groups. And we've done that in England, we've done that in Ohio, we do it in California. Um, and every time we do something like that, it takes the, the work to another whole level of, of understanding of saying, yeah, here's the data, but more importantly, this is why we're getting the data we're getting. And even more importantly than that, this is what we're doing with that data to make a difference. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's exactly what you're talking about. It's just being very systematic about data, what we do with it and how we use it. Typically we get data and what's the first thing we do? We compare ourselves to something else. Rather than saying, what does this data first mean? Um, how can I make it better? Um, and what are we going to do about it? How, how, ultimately, how can I take responsibility for it? Yeah, that's the beauty of, of the surveys. That's what I designed them. I class on my voice because it gives you data you can then analyze and, and look into the move forward. And, that, and that's, the, that's the strength of it, I think. There's a real science behind it, which is, which is great. But in if you, I thought you talked before about assessment in terms of you know, examination results and things. And, it's not to do that. It will use your data and the survey data to get better results, but it's through developing skills and, and sort of, you know, there's the self, self worth and engagement and stuff instead. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what's interesting. We do, we're using the, um, the student voice data in, in LA, and man, they have more assessment issues than you can shake a stick at. Yet there are schools that want this data because they see this data telling them something different they haven't been asked before. But there's no data out there that gets a kid's hopes and dreams or even knowing their names for that matter or asking kids, does it matter if I'm absent from school? Um, so I, it's digging that a little deeper. Going to your point about these 21st century skills, it's making them much more purposeful. The other thing I just I want to add this, and then I want to open this up uh, and give it back to Mick and you, Steve, to see if this question specifically for you. One of the questions uh, that Mickey asked us to think about was, how do you celebrate student voice? And th there's lots of ways to do it. My advice would be, you need to do it consistently. Um, it, it can't be an event. Like celebrating student voice once a semester or at graduation, I mean, then it becomes a token. Um, celebrating voice, celebrating aspirations is gonna be this ongoing thing. And again, to your whole point, that this becomes a way of being and celebrating successes isn't like, you know, it's Christmas, so let's have a celebration or it's, you know, the 4th of July, let's, let's celebrate. Granted, I know the 4th of July is not a big day in England, um, but you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, about, it's about recognizing and celebrating on a daily basis when it occurs and not at some made up time. Let me bring up Mickey back up and, and you can guys can have a talk about um, some of the pieces that you're working on, but also Mick, if, if you could give some updates with Steve up there with you about some of our other sites and what's going on there. Um, yeah, I do. I just want to piggyback on that before I do some quick updates. Um, when Steve and, and Russ were talking about the uh, power of the framework to influence students' academic outcomes, and, and Steve, you were talking about the, uh, the science behind the surveys. We know um, from uh, statistical science that we conduct on the surveys that kids, and you may have heard Russ talk about this before, we know that kids who are, uh, have self-worth, you mentioned self-worth a lot, developing student self-worth, that those students are five times more likely to be academically motivated 
than students who don't have self-worth. And to the extent that there's a connection between academic motivation and academic performance, obviously working on a student's self-worth is part and parcel of helping them do better in school. Um, some of the updates we have from the uh, uh, schools in the United States are you know, the ongoing work in Youngstown. The, the schools there continue to uh, integrate student voice and um, the framework into their work uh, to good effect. Um, that is a district that was in a lot of trouble about five years ago um, in academic distress and is really starting to um, not just, uh, as I said to them two or three years ago, they stopped circling the drain thing. Uh, but they're actually starting to circle in the other direction now. Um, and although the variables there are very complicated, uh, the turnaround, um, you know, it's not just us turning around that district, but we're happy to take some of the credit for that. Uh, not us, actually. The students um, need to take some of the credit for that because as their voice uh, is feeling heard uh, and their suggestions, their ideas how to improve their schools and their district uh, uh, continue to be listened to by at the superintendent level. Um, the, the kids um, about a month ago had a, uh, a meeting with the superintendent of the schools there, the interim superintendent, um, and really, uh, you know, listened to them and took to heart what they said. So the more they feel their voice is um, being listened to, the more they want to be at school and the more schools improve there. Um, in Oklahoma City, I'm not sure if I mentioned this last time, um, student voice is one of five major pillars of something they call the great commitment there. Um, and so that's uh, an initiative of Superintendent of Schools, Rob New there, and um, that great commitment was actually just not Rob's doing, but the result of a community-wide listening se session last year, um, and they institute student voice as one of the pillars of their great commitment. Um, and so several of the other uh, pillars actually also have to do with school climate and school culture and making schools safe places for kids, not just physically in terms of you know, everybody's got an anti-bullying thing now, but um, emotionally safe places for, for kids too. So the stuff we talk about, when we talk about spirit of adventure so that students are not afraid uh, to fail, but they're not afraid to succeed either, uh, which can be really challenging um, in some of our schools. Um, there's a school in South Carolina that continues to plug away at our work and has had really um, uh, a fun experience of that student team and, and also, uh, referencing back to the teacher voice stuff, not just teacher voice, but staff voice. So it, it seems like once you sort of figure out student voice and once you figure out teacher voice, well then, you know, people like uh, the and admin assistants and the people working in the cafeteria and the custodian says, okay, well, wait, hey, what about us? Like we want to have a voice too. So that's uh, the next frontier in, um, oh, I'll have to de defer to my colleague. Is it South Conway Elementary School, I think? Uh, in Conway, South Carolina that we're working in there. Um, Lisa Landy, who doesn't have bandwidth, but just sent me a text message that says, uh, Montana, uh, and I remember seeing this email too, Montana is conducting a round of teacher uh, voice focus groups throughout the state. Steve York uh, and Kim York, I believe, are, are going around doing that. Um, there is someone here from Montana. Uh, Aaron is from Montana. Um, so that work in Montana continues at the statewide level there. I'm psyched to go back there in about a month to continue that work, both in, um, in the area of teacher voice, but also work uh, in the mental health field, which is, is what uh, Erin oversees and the juvenile detention centers there. That's an exciting uh, cutting edge of the work right now, um, as well as the ongoing work with student voice in the state of Montana, particularly uh, with Indian education there. So that's some of it. Um, I want to uh, invite um, is it Peter Donaldson, um, Zach, to come up and he's got a question or he's going to post a question. Um, so I want to get that one question in before our time runs out. Here we go. Can I, can the, I know my class survey be applied as low as kindergarten? Um, you're, you'll see our colleague there, Susan, uh, jumping up and down and applauding your question, uh, Peter. Um, the answer to that question is applied, yes. Um, used off the shelf as a survey that kids take online, no. Um, so this, the, I know my class survey is for kids in grades uh, uh, three, grade three, I'm just double checking that, not grade two, grade three up to uh, grade five, and there's obviously a version for kids in grade six to grade 12. 
And then there are tools for applying the survey in conversations with kids grades K to two. Um, the reason for that is there's a lot of studies out there that kids don't just take surveys well in those grades, something about their lack of abstract thinking skill. Um, but that um, being said, um, it's absolutely appropriate and to get kids that young feeling like they have a say and a voice in their class. And we, we do that through uh, focus groups and conversations. Um, Russ is going to chime in there. Maybe he knows something I don't know about the survey. So maybe if we can replace uh, Steve with Russ, um, and he can he can comment on that as well. Yeah, thank, thanks, Mick. No, it's not something that you don't know. It's just it's, I don't want to forget to say this because it's to Peter's point, and I know Dr. Fox and Dr. DeWitt would be upset with us if we did not mention this, and I should have mentioned it early on. One of the projects that we're working on now um, between Quiza um, is with NAESP, the National Association of Elementary School Principals, because this has been an area that we've been somewhat remiss in, not somewhat, we have been remiss in. Um, and the project is called Age Three to Grade Three. And people like Mickey, Lisa, Brian, Susan Inman, uh, and virtually every one of our staff members have been out there doing focus studies and preliminary research study to figure out what we can learn around student voice and aspirations at the younger grades. So Peter, to answer your question, Mickey's exactly right. There are certainly some things to adapt to that, um, but the preliminary age three to grade three report will be out in February, and then we're going to go on a full, full, full throttle um, and figure out um, how to get the voices of those kids so they mean something that we're asking the right questions. It's been an amazing learning experience so far. Um, I don't think Chris is on because um, she's in Oklahoma with, with Brian Conley and they were both doing the studies. Uh, I also know Peter is, is on site somewhere and um, they interestingly blew Mickey and, and I off to do their work in the schools. I don't know what they were thinking. Um, but and also we just, will have some yeah, we will have some things posted on that, but it's really important, Peter, and, and thank you for mentioning that. I'll make sure we have some time with that. As a matter of fact, I know we will because I've invited Gail Conley, the executive director of NASP, to be our next guest. So um, we we will address that, but it, you're absolutely, your, your question is spot on. Um, and we're not ahead of that loop, but we're certainly part of that loop and we'll move it in that direction. Yeah, uh, um, I popped into the uh, chat room that for everybody, the, a resource that we have available free on our website for how to do focus groups with kids in K2, so check out that link. And then Eric Nichols, who's uh, in the group here, makes the point that um, third grade results from the survey will tell a lot about a school in grades two as well, uh, not just a class, but about the school. So you look at those what those third graders are saying and you have the accumulation in the sense of their uh, K to two experience. Um, yep. already manifesting itself in the third grade. But go ask them, use that focus group uh, protocol and, and go ask the kids directly. Um, we're kind of at time here. I kind of had a really big question to end with, Russ. I don't know if you're game for that. Um, Only if I know the answer. <laughs> oh, you voice working. Yeah, okay, sorry, I'm just reading a, a message. Um, you know, you, you started off and, and we've had, we've seen you in Dubai now, we've had Steve talking to us from the UK, um, you, you mentioned Sweden and LA um, as some of the bigger things coming down the pike. Um, when you think like of that global picture of, you know, student voice, when you think of student voice in sort of that mode, what are you thinking like five years from now? Are we looking at a radically different set of schools because of student voice? What, what's your vision, you know, not just for tomorrow when we're, we're in Sweden or LA or wherever, but a little further down the road, what's your vision? Wow, Nick, that's actually a very big question and um, would have been good hope? if you prepped me on that question before you <laughs> asked it. <laughs> no, that was, we lose the spontaneity of the moment. <laughs> So the first thing that comes to my mind is retirement and moving to that camp that I'm building across the street. Um, but other than that, um, I'll tell you where I do see, and I, and I see this literally going from the Dubai 
to the Swedens, to the Californians, to the Idahos, to the Oregons, and, and literally everything in between. Uh, it's becoming accepted now um, as, as a norm that needs to happen. It's no longer, I don't, and I see this, I even see it at the governments. Um, it's no longer perceived as an added component. It's seen as this is a critical component. It's, I think of the same way towards student voices I do about 21st century skills, things that people call soft skills. Nothing, you know this, nothing annoys me more than, more than when people call our work the soft skills. I'm saying, no, those aren't soft, those are essential skills. And I think the same thing with student voice. Student voice isn't like, yeah, that's a good idea, we should try to do that. No, student voice is the idea, you have to do it because that's what schools are about. And I really see that. We've had huge policy implications um, over the past four or five years. ESSA, when you get into that, there's more about student teacher voice in that piece than you would think. Um, but it's about measuring things differently. It's about looking at things differently. It's about not only suggesting, but it's insisting that student voice and teacher voice become a part of the solutions, and then they accept responsibility. Um, so I, I see this massive shift, quite frankly. And what I like about this shift I don't see it as a pendulum shift where we go from one extreme to another extreme. I really see momentum building to say this is important. And I feel like the work that we're doing and the people that are on this webinar and the people that we're working with are helping us maintain that shift in thinking because of the data, um, because of they're talking about the work, they're writing about the work. Just mm -hmm. I was in that chat room with Eric. Eric's talking about doing work around technology and student voice. A number of people on here looking at studies around student voice, teacher voice, obviously the work that Lisa Landy's leading and others. So I just don't see this as the newest fad, the newest thing coming down the road. But I see in five years that this becomes the integral piece that's keeping us moving and changing the way we're looking at education. See, you are that good on your feet. You didn't need any. It would have been, I can't imagine it would have been better had I uh, prepped you, so <laughs> that's great. I'm, I'm, I'm going to bow out. Steve's going to come back up to say goodbye to everybody from across the pond, and um, I'll see you later, Russ. <laughs> great. Thank you, Mickey, and, um, and certainly a, a, a heartfelt thanks to Steve, who has been with us through thick and thin. He's talked about the good times, and I can tell you, and, and he will also tell you, it's not an easy it's not an easy course to take but it's the right course to take what we're seeing now are schools that for lack of a better word we're struggling and we're not at their best doing unbelievable well uh, unbelievably well so steve i'm gonna hand this over to you for a last minute or so of, of words of wisdom from from england for us and then i'll sign off thanks russ it's um, it's good to hear from you guys uh, and i have been working with russ and mickey and Chris Fox for a long time, and uh, there's some great work there. And um, certainly, the thousands we've got about 5,000 young people in our schools in England, and uh, they're all massively benefiting from the aspirations work. So, um, if anybody wants any examples of the things a bit different in England, you're very welcome to go on our website and have a look at it. But, uh, but thank you, Russ, and uh, thank you, Mickey. Enjoyed that. You're welcome. We did too, Stephen. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, I'm not sure exactly where I'm going to be next month at this time, um, but we'll see everybody in about a month, and we'll tweet out um, the information about that. If people want to email me directly, please do that. It's just qualia at qisa.org, um, mickey at corso, C-O-R-S-O, at quiza.org, or you can tweet me anytime you want. Um, it's at Dr. Russ Q, D-R-R-U-S-S-Q. Um, Free to do that. Special thanks to, to Shindig and Corwin and the Aspirations Academy Trust for all that you're doing and everybody else out there that's making a difference. So good luck and fingers crossed that I'll be plowed out of here before next month. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Bye.